Hello and welcome back to another episode of Africa 5. The podcast where you get to learn a little bit more about the professional hunters that you really love. Today we have a very special guest. She has hunted the length and breadth of Zimbabwe as a freelance professional hunter. Yes, you heard me right. She. She is Tanya Blake. Welcome to Africa 5, Tanya. Thank you very much for having me, Andy. When did you know exactly when was the point that you wanted to be a professional hunter? So one time, um, it was a zebra hunt in particular for my dad. And I've always felt partial to horses <laughs> because I grew up on a farm. And I kind of always saw the similarity between a zebra and a horse, which I think a lot of people do. Um, and I, you know, played polo, polo cross, and I felt very hard done by getting forced to shoot this horse with pajamas on and was very discouraged and unaccepting of it. And, you know, when you're a very young age of like eight or nine, you're kind of like, shame, that's my friend. And um, after shooting the zebra, I went up to it and instead of being like, you know, brush it off, kid, it's, it's an animal. My dad took the time to be like, open its mouth, look at its teeth. How old is it? How old do you think this animal is? And what do you think his role was in the herd? If a, you know, if another stallion comes into this herd, is he not, you know, zebras are, you know, they do practice infanticide. So what role have you played in this whole zebra's herd's life? And listening to him explain, you know, how you've changed things and how old it is and, you know, just that little moment, I thought to myself, either I learn to to know to to learn better or to become better at this or I sit on the fence of I don't understand so I'm just going to have one opinion about it so for me that zebra hunt in particular the more you understand something the more you can talk about it or teach about it project about it Tan I know one of the things I get very frustrated about is people thinking because we hunters we don't love animals what have you got to say to that I grew up with more than one animal in my house. And when I say that, I mean on the farm, there was always, oh, we found a stray warthog or we found a stray bushbuck or, you know, um, we even so much as had a stray hippo in our river one year on the farm, which we managed to help her and get her going again. As hunters, animals are our assets because it's not just about the money. It's about creating a habitat for them that they can survive for the next however many years or generations. That's the biggest part in trying to tell people we love the animals enough to to look after them in a way that maybe not everyone understands, but if you're big enough to have an opinion about it, then at least be big enough to learn about it. I couldn't agree with you more, Tan. And I think the biggest problem that we face at the moment is the green movement and, you know, they have no ill intentions. They just want the animals to be happy and, and survive. Mm -hmm. But what they don't realize is that I'd say, uh, uh, don't quote me on this, but it, I'd say 80% of Africa's wildlife lives outside of national parks. Yeah. And everybody thinks that everywhere should just be a national park. But you need the numbers of photographic clients to justify turning hunting areas into photographic areas, but there just aren't enough numbers. Yeah. And the hunters are looking after those, that 80% of wildlife. So if people call for the ban of hunting, that's going to be 80% of African wildlife that is wiped out. And I, d I just don't think people understand that hunters are protecting that, that many animals. It's not even about green versus red call hunting. And I think that's what a lot of them make it out to be. We have the common goal, and that is to educate the people in Africa right now that we all have one goal. And we all want to survive. We all want to feed our families. We all want to protect the wildlife because it's such a huge generation of funds for Africa. If all the animals died tomorrow, what would people come to Africa to see? Not the people. Not the derelict churches that people have come and done or set up, not the beach in Cape Town, 
they want to see giraffe and elephant and lions. They want to see the king of the jungle. They want to see all that stuff. The only way that stuff can survive is if people realize to educate the cultures that we are faced with every single day. It's not even about black, white or whatever. Like I said, it's just education is key. And until the green and the red sectors can merge mm. to educate together, it's fighting against thunder. Yeah, and that's the the saddest thing is there's this huge war that's going on with call it the greenies mm -hmm. versus the hunters, and they both want the same thing. Yeah, they both want the animals to survive. They both want a place for the for the wildlife, and and that's what we we all have to come to realize is that mm -hmm. hunters are not evil. You know, I love an elephant just as much as the guy who goes and takes a photo of it you know yeah. we don't shoot every elephant that we come across we shoot the old elephants and that's why it takes so long that's why an elephant hunt is 21 days because you have to spend your 21 days searching for that old elephant and that's the hardest uh, fight i think we all do is sometimes you're talking to a brick wall which is sad mm -hmm. it's not even frustrating it's so sad because I don't suffer, you don't suffer, the greenies don't suffer. Who suffers? The animals suffer. And that's the saddest part is you fighting and yelling and all that stuff and you're not even the person who's suffering. Yeah. So. At the end of the day, we shouldn't fight each other and we should just try and understand each other. But unfortunately, as soon as someone hears the word hunting, that's not a hunter. Yeah. They close it off and they don't listen anymore. But then again, there are also hunters that do need to be called out that don't stick to rules and regulations. And Absolutely. I think as a hunting industry, that's where we do go wrong is we don't call them out enough. Yeah. And going forward, I think we're going to have to do that. Tan, I don't know if you remember, but I think it was back in 2011. I went for my learner professional hunter's license. And I think that is where I met you. Do you remember that? I think I vaguely do. Was so, the written exam? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it was the written exam. And basically, I got to my written exam and I didn't really know anyone because as apprentice hunters, we spend our whole time in the bush and we don't really have peers because we're so isolated. And I remember bumping into Tanya and saying, hey, Tan, uh, you know, nice to meet you. What are you here for? And she said, no, I'm here to do my professional hunter's license. I want to be a hunter. And to me, that was just the most incredible thing because I never, I thought maybe she's here to be a guide or talk us through a little bit because the Zimbabwe professional hunter's license is the hardest professional hunter's license to get in Africa. I mean, people can argue it, but it, it's the truth. Talk us through a little bit about w the steps in what you have to go through to get your Zimbabwe professional hunter's license. What you basically have to do once you have your learner's license is have no less than two years solid under one operating company. Um, and at the end of that, a PH within the, um, within their company will sign off for you. So basically putting their neck out on the line for you. And there was very little people that would respond to me. You know, I, I'm not going to drop names or anything, but I applied to several companies and my dad even applied in my place and said, you know, my kid wants to do the hunting license, et cetera, et cetera, just to, just to see. And it was like, yes, no, sure, sure, come. And then when it was brought forward that I was a, that I was a woman, it was like, mm, okay, well, let me just check with my wife. Let me just check with this. Let me just check with that. I understand that, you know, the way the world works. Eventually... I found some very cool people and I went into a photographic sector and I spent two and a half years there um, until I was able to find um, two professional hunters who I will name because I'm so proud to be under them, which was Dean Kendall and Lance Nisbet. And they put their necks on the line for me and I went and did a lot of um, all of the hunts that they had. They would take me on as their apprentice and... Um, Dean Kendall probably being the root of all of the hunter that I am today about ethics and age and, you know, was pretty much instilled for him. Sorry, I'm diverting. But, um, you know, once once I got through the written exam, 
you then have to go on to getting as a professional hunter no less than five dangerous game experience so you have to understand if you shoot five elephants um, and no buffalo or no cat experience you will be hugely probably not let through on your orals from that so you have to have a good variation of buffalo elephant cat hunting you know walking various things skinning everything once you get to shooting test it's basically near and far running with your gun loading it etc etc which was a difficult experience for me altogether because when I got to my shooting exam I was told that the girlfriends can wait behind the line um (laughs) and then when they realized that I was there to shoot they're all like oh okay and I ended up coming second which was a huge moment for me because maybe they took me a little bit more seriously when I was told by several people not to go for my shooting test because I wasn't ready sorry second over 40 there were 40 people shooting and you came second yeah congratulations thank you after your shooting test um as long as you have all of your required animals you then get to your oral examination which for me was the hardest of them all because you walk into a room of maybe call it 18 people and there'll be several phs maybe four five six and the rest are national parks zimbabwean national parks representatives and there's several trophies around the room like how old is that buffalo how what size elephant did those tusks come from how old is that leopard there'll be a book of skins and these literally maybe like this much skin. <laughs> It'll be like, is it a reed buck? Is it an impala? Is it a this? Is it a squirrel? <laughs> you just have to have skinned enough to know what you're doing. And I think it's more of a character thing. So for me, I was so nervous that I, I I'm like, I was shaking like a leaf. Do you keep your composure or do you do you lose it? And I think that for me was the hardest part, but I managed to get through. And the next part after that was your practical, which is ten days safari. And you take all of your examiners and you have to shoot a buffalo and you have to shoot an elephant. And they will make you track. They will make you skin. You have to put up a whole entire camp for them and feed them and give them drinks and treat them basically like a client. And they examine you every part of the way. Um, And that, for me, was muscle memory. And I had the best time on my practical. You make the best friends because you're put with complete randoms that you don't know. Your examiner you don't know. Um... And it's grueling because it's tough physically. It's very tough physically um, and emotionally because how old is it? Where? Is it? How far are you? Eight yards, 10 yards, 20 yards, all these approaches on elephants and stuff. But the the biggest reward obviously is you get through it and you don't feel bad because it's muscle memory. And to me, like that's what it is. And Tan, how long does that whole process take? So I, well... Mine took me six years. Um, the last two and a bit years, I was um, under my, my final company, which was a, so like a hunting safari company. So I was very blessed to get a place with them. I was under some of Zimbabwe's top, 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 top guys. Um, they still are today. Um, Who are those guys? I was under Cliff Walker, uh, Louis Muller, Frick Muller, Spike Clarsen, um I still put Dean Kendall up there because, you know, through a lot of the grueling stages of that, he he was a backbone to me. Hunting generally is a a male-dominated sport, should I say. And all men like a woman holding a gun. (laughs) So (laughs) on that topic, what, what, uh, what weapon do you carry, Tan? So I've been very lucky to inherit a 416 Rigby made by Ruger. And that gun was my granddad's gun. And it was passed, well, he, to get a bit of history on it, he was a huge, huge hunter. This is before um, professional hunting was even licensed. So it just, you know, back in the day when, you know, they would decide, okay, I'm going to take these people hunting before there was even any licensed system or the, you know, the Zifka system was in place. Um, And he used that gun on probably more animals than both you and I have had hot breakfast. (laughs) And it was passed down to my dad. And the day after, well, when my results were read out on me qualifying, um, that's when my dad came to me and said, with the, you know, with the permit all being changed into my name. And he said, this is now yours. So it's, 
I can't imagine carrying anything else um, because it's it's not only you know it's a precious family heirloom, but it's a it's a well you know it functions well and it's well used. It's worn, so it's got so much character, and I know it you know like the back of my hand. So I'm very lucky. Tan, you talk about your grandfather and your father. How much has your upbringing influenced your career? Our holidays is in August holidays. We get the whole month off. So for the for the whole of the August holidays was down in Tuli Tuli Circle and that was hunting in Pila, Elan, Buffalo, maybe the odd, you know, leopard if we had a chance to get that on a bag. But, you know, for me it was you know, my dad and my granddad have been the, the instilling factor. You know, I've been I was always the oldest grandchild. So I was always put in the front line and, you know, I wasn't allowed to shoot anything for a very long time. You know, I was to learn how to skin it and what it is and how old it is. And, you know, so from a very young age, I've always, it's what I've known. And, you know, you do what you grow up, you know, you are what you know as you grow up. So I think I can thank both of them. And I'm, you know, very privileged to have at least taken another generation on a hunt with me since I've qualified. So I can thank both of them to this day. Not only do you do hunting, you do a bit of photographic guiding as well. Do you enjoy that? I absolutely love it. It's where I started. Um, it's where I was given my first little like chance, so to say. Um, not just the walking, the, you know, I mean, as a bush person, you get to see the most incredible things. And in photographic areas, you often can get much closer to the animals um, without it being a disturbance as, as such, you know, um, Zimbabwe is very unique in the parks that we have. You can get extremely close to the wildlife, which is not um, unique to a lot of other countries. Um, and it's, for me, it's instilling the wonder, you know, when you, you know, the like you get close to animals or you just see them doing what they're doing um, and you get to see the, the awe on people's faces. And, for me, when you're hunting or guiding, it's about instilling that, you know, the little fire that we all have inside of us, no matter how tough you are or old or young or whatever you are. When something amazing happens in front of you, you see that little like, and and that's the reward. I am huge into fishing. <laughs> I am a, I'm a, I'm a daddy's girl in that department. I love me some fishing, whether it's in a puddle outside the backyard, <laughs> hoping that something will bite. Or, um, look, it's it's hard to say, but I think for me, a huge downtime is just to take my take my little dog and go to the bush, either with some close friends or it's crazy that I go to the bush to get away from it. Um, but that's what I do. I love to go on my own walking. I um, sounds weird, but I love to go just walking. Um, go to the bush camp, light a little fire, put my stretcher out and just just be on your own a little bit. Um, but I do. I love all of my friends. I have the most afraid, amazing friends in my life and they all support me and understand what I do. Um, some of them don't understand it, but they, they understand me and it makes me happy. So they're happy. So I'm very lucky. I basically fish, be in the bush or spend time with my friends. That's what makes me happy. <laughs> Do you have a favorite animal to hunt? Definitely. For me, leopards. I'm just one of those weird cat ladies, I guess. Um, I absolutely love the challenge, the thrill. You know, you, you can put a piece of meat out and anything might come from a hyena to a honey badger to a whatever. But to get the oldest, oldest cat for me is the biggest reward. Between a leopard hunt and tuskless elephant, I love hunting tuskless elephant. It's obviously we all know it's a thrill, but it's um it's extremely hard work. Um, and for me, what I love, w humans are pretty small creatures, and when you're faced down with a herd of elephant, you suddenly remember your place. Um, but it's you know, it's got to be a certain age. She can't be the matriarch. She can't. Be, I like. Anyone that's hunted with me, clients, hey, <laughs> they'll know that I'm like, nope, 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 until I find the oldest, you know, least participating member of the herd. And and for me, just to, you know, to get close to them and to get 
to a place where, you know, you get to see a very humble human is so special. So, but yeah, yeah. I would say leopard, elephant, eland, buffalo. I love all the things that make you walk. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. I'm with you on that. And uh, Tasso's elephant and leopard are two things that when it comes down to crunch time, yeah. my Bobby, you better have your <laughs> shoes on good because they want to run. But your heart goes and it really does take a lot of concentration to, to make it happen. Yeah. And especially as a professional hunter because you're leading the show. So I'm just the little cameraman at the back, but I still, my heart feels like going to pop out of my chest. <laughs> Me too, Andy, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Tan, us as Africans, we all love buffalo hunting. Mm -hmm. What makes a good trophy on a buffalo for you? For me, it's about the age. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. When you walk around the corner and you see that giant spread or drop or thick, big bosses, you're like, ah! I mean, it gets you excited. But for me, the best trophy I've ever taken um, or since I even started in the industry, seen a PH take, sorry to all of them who never shot a scrum cap. <laughs> I'm going to brag a little bit. <laughs> but when I took this scrum cap was the greatest reward of my life. The older, the better, because you are, you are hunting, you know, the old guy that is, he's figured out, you know, how to get this far and he's bred and he's lived and, you know, I mean, the, you could see on his gums where the grass, every time he ate, was cutting, you know, his gums as he's pulling. Um, so for us, it was like we took this big old guy, uh, uh, scrum cap old guy. Like it wasn't even, it was, my client was over the moon. I was, for me, it was amazing. So. Well, Tan, if anyone who's watching would like to follow you or find out about more about who you are and what you do, where can they find you? So, unfortunately, I'm just about to launch in a few days on a website, which I will put up on Facebook. But basically look up anything to do with Tanya Blake Safaris and there's Instagram or there's a Facebook page at the moment um, or Tanya Blake Safaris at gmail.com if you really have 10 million questions. Um, but I am up there and I'm happy to answer any questions and get to know people or take people hunting or photographic. Um like I said, it's just all I want to do is share my perspective on what I do every day. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us on Africa 5. You are a huge inspiration to a lot of people. Um, thank you so much for flying the Zimbabwe flag very high. You do great things and you're a great custodian of African wildlife. So thank you very much for talking to us on Africa 5. Folks, thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Tanya. We'll be back next time for a little bit more on your favorite professional hunters. Subscribe. See you there.